Okay, should we get going? I'm sure there'll be a few more people that join, but we can admit them as we go along. Uh, so thank you everyone for joining us for the second Cold Spacing Conversations uh, event. I'm Helena, I work at Feedback um, and I work in the Northwest on our Regional Food Economy Programme. Um, and tonight we will be talking about access to land. Um, so we'll be talking about everything to do with um, community growing schemes to uh, land ownership, to um, some really new, some new projects that are going on. Um, and we'd really like to know about who you are, uh, what your interest is, and if you are growing anything. So there is a poll um, and you can let us know if you're already growing food or if you're kind of an enthusiastic onlooker. Um, but also if you want to introduce yourself in the chat, please feel free to. Um, so we've got some really, really fantastic panelists for you tonight. We've got Freya Robinson from Old Tree Market Garden, Keenan from Alchemic Kitchen, who's my colleague, um, Helen Woodcock from the Kingland Trust, and Kate Swade from Shared Assets. Um, and everybody will be doing a very um, kind of five minute presentation, um, and then you'll have a chance to ask questions. And you can send questions in uh, through the chat as we're going along. Um, and if you want to ask your own question, um, just please let us know when you put your question in. And when it comes to the question time, we can share screen and you can ask your question um, directly. So um, I think we'll get started. I'm going to ask um, Freya to go first. Um, so Freya, if you've got your presentation ready, um, I'll pass over to you. Hi, everybody. Oops, Can you hear me now? Sorry, I didn't unmute it. <laughs> um, Can you hear me? Sorry. Okay, great. Okay. I'm Freya. Um, I just started up Old Tree Market Garden. Um, I've been farming for about seven years and I knew that I really wanted to do my own thing and it took me a good few years to work out how to do it. And I think it's different for everyone, but I just thought I'd share some of my key points that I found. So I'm going to try and share my screen. Share. Is that good? Has everyone got, got my screen? Play. So I just did a presentation just because I can't just talk at my face. Um, there we go. So I had no idea where to start and I thought, okay, I first thought I'd have to buy land and very quickly gave that up because it's just ridiculously expensive. I'm in Southeast England in, in Sussex. Um, it's about 10,000 pounds an acre and that's for agricultural land that's in the middle of nowhere. If it's anywhere near a station or anything like that, you're going way up. Um, I actually bid it on a piece of land. It, was, it went for 270,000 for five acres with nothing on it. That's the kind of prices we're looking at down here. Um, so my first point was, uh, what do you really want? I, I thought that I'd have to have the land first and then do it afterwards, but actually I realized, no, I've got, to, I've got to create the vision before even having the land. I've got to manifest it in my brain um, before actually finding the right piece so that you know what it is that you really want. Um, if you're not sure, there's loads of options. You can talk to farmers around the local area where you want to start it, talk to, find as many community projects, all the projects that you possibly can. I just, I just spoke to absolutely everybody and got as many insights and help as I could. Um, and woofing is amazing. If you, if you really like the idea of what someone else is doing, go and give them a hand and actually find out and, and work with them on a one-to-one -one basis. And um, you can often, even if they don't offer volunteering, you, could, uh, just ask, there's, there's, you can only ask. Um, but yeah, lots of things to think about. Um, I didn't really think about all of them before I started. Uh, water being a main one, having access to water to be able to water your plants if it's plants you're gonna be growing. Um, yeah, really refine it down exactly what you need. Um, and yeah, and, and think about all of these different things. Some of them might be more important for you or less important. Um, it could be good to put them in a list so that you know you have to have two acres, um, but you're open to access or you don't necessarily need a car park. So, and then so list them in a sort of like, yeah, I think I've got this in the next slide, actually. How do I do it? Yeah. List everything into essential and non-essential or desirable. Um, so things that you're not willing to compromise on and things that you are, and it'll make it much easier to find land because <laughs> everywhere, nowhere is going to be absolutely perfect. Um, but yeah, I, I, I started by writing a business plan. I found that really, really helpful. And at first I thought, oh, but it's going to change. Like, you know, I don't really know specifically what I want. I don't even have the land yet, but you've got to start with that to be able to, to move on to what land you need. Um, so I really recommend writing one. There's loads of templates online. I just, I just sort of, found everything I could and then um, sort of created it for my own thing. 
Um, and it's fine and it will change. It will change as time goes on once you find your land, but that's totally fine. You can amend it, but you've got a starting platform where you've got your ideas on paper and it's really concise and you can be like, this is my plan. <laughs> and you can show it to farms as well. For there we go. Make it a reality. Make it a reality. Oh, whoa, it's... Sorry, it was feedbacking. Can you hear me? Yeah, it's okay now. Um, I thought I'd have to have the land before I could actually like create anything, you know, marketing, whatever, speaking to customers, but it's not true at all. Someone, a friend of mine convinced me to just, just pretend you have the land. Well, not even pretend you have the land, but, but make the business a thing. It's only in your head. So make it, make it a reality. Um, create online media accounts, start talking about what you're doing and, and what you want to be doing um, as if, as if it's already happening. Um, you don't need to have got the land before you can start doing that. Once you start talking about it and putting the ideas out into the, into the world, into other people's um, I, uh, spaces, it, it, it'll, I, I totally believe in the ripple effect and it's well worth, um, yeah, just going for it before you've actually got anywhere. Um, and then it, things will start to ripple into you too. <laughs> So yeah, start asking. Just just ask as many people as you possibly can in 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 person as well as online. Um, I just put on posts on ev everywhere saying this is you know this is what I want. I went on found loads of really good social media groups like um, Brighton and Hove groups. There's local Sussex groups. There's farming groups. There's Diggers and Dreamers is a great one. Um, just just find all the groups you possibly can and put it out there. The only thing that people can say is no. So there's no harm in asking. You've got to get good at uh, dealing with no's as well. That happens a lot, <laughs> but that's absolutely fine. Um, and I found all the places that I found so far in my life have never been advertised. I've never found anything where it's, you know, like land for rent three acres. That's, that's never happened. The land that I live on here, um, I was just talking to my landlord just now. I asked about 300 people before suddenly someone was like, yeah, yeah, of course, you can come live here. It's fine. <laughs> But, um, and the same with the land that I'm at now, where I'm starting my market garden. Um, they were open to the idea of having a farmer on site on a little plot, but they didn't want to advertise. They, it was just an idea. So um, it was only through a network of, of people that I'd spoken to that the word got passed on to this farm. Uh, someone that I knew worked there and she mentioned it to the, to the, to the owners and they went, ah, oh, that, that might work here. Yeah, give her a call, get her in. And so I would never have found that if I just looked without asking. Um, so just, just, just ask. Um, and I think that might be the end of my presentation. Yay, good luck. <laughs> if you have any questions, leave them in the little chat and I can ask, uh, answer them later. Um, hope that was okay. <laughs> Thank you so much, Freya. Um, I mean, you just, you just seem so tenacious. It just seems like you've had this vision and you've gone for it, um, which is incredible. I'm sure plenty of people watching will have questions for you, um, which we will get to after our presentations. Um, so now I'm going to pass on to Keenan. Um, Keenan works with me in Alchemic Kitchen in the Northwest. Um, and we've been working on a community growing scheme, um, which kind of incorporates using bathtubs. So before I say too much, Keenan is going to run a presentation. So Keenan, I'll pass over to you. Thank you very much. I'll just share screen. that here we go so as Elena just said I, I'm Keenan and I work on the feedback regional food economies program up here in the northwest we work across Merseyside but predominantly Nosley um, I just want to talk about a it's an idea really rather than we, we've not really established this it's something that we want to pilot um, but a bit of background on the work that we do um, so we work with communities to try and create uh, better, more sustainable food systems. Um, there's a big issue in Nosley with uh, people struggling to access fresh, nutritious food. Um, so we want to work with communities to make that better for them. There's a number of reasons why that is an issue. Um, and we know that this, this growing project is essentially, it's not going to solve everything magically and we're not going to be able to grow enough food to um, just instantly feed everybody but it's a really nice way to engage with communities and discuss what they want in their um, area where they live and what will make their lives easier um, so why bathtubs uh, it seems a little bit of a random one um, but a couple of years ago now we were introduced to a lady called Morgan who'd set up quite a successful business called Plug Hole Planters. Um, so really this, this idea is borrowed from her with her permission. Um, 
but essentially the idea is that you rescue bathtubs um, from landfill. They don't really break down in landfill. Um, so you're doing the environment a favor. Um, they're pretty much purpose built for a raised planter. They're great if you don't have a lot of space. In the picture you can see here, this is in our little um, courtyard by our kitchen in Nosley. Um, so we've just planted some tomato plants and some squash and some strawberries um, and chives. So we don't have tons of space there. So it's really good um, in that sense. Um, they're built to last for every 10 bathtubs we save from landfill. Um, it stops the equivalent of about one ton of CO2, the, the equivalent of one ton of CO2 emissions um, going up into the environment. So that's great. And generally speaking, they hold about 200 litres um, of compost. So our thinking is, this is how we want to sort of link in to community grow spaces. Um, we work across sectors quite collaboratively in Nosley. And one of the sectors we work really closely with is the faith sector. Um, the thinking is that the Church of England is, owns a vast amount of land across the UK. But in Nosley, there's 14 Ch Church of England churches all with grounds which in theory have uh, good access um, for people in the community so there can be an element of ownership in the grow spaces. Um, another big plus and we might talk about this later is that because the Church of England own the land there's no chance that it's going to really that it's going to be sold off and developed on so that there's an opportunity there for long-term partnership and creating sort of a long-term project which hopefully communities will really want to engage in or engage with. Um, other areas of how we've sort of planned to hope to integrate this into communities. We're working with social landlords. Um, so they tend to, as po just standard policy, um, change all of their bathroom suites. I think every 10 years, they said. So they're actually a major contributor to the issue of sort of bathtubs going to landfill. So they're really keen to engage with us. Um, We've also had conversations with procurement and town planning organisations and we want to try and make that part of sort of a, one of their green initiatives. Um, they're really keen in Nosley anyway to sort of make uh, lasting change to how they operate and engage with communities. Um, and we just really want to give the communities, people in the community ownership of the space. Um, I talked about food access and that being a problem in Nosley but just giving access to food is not a whole part of a solution without the education and just giving education is not a whole part without giving access. So this sits quite nicely with the rest of the work we do because we can engage, we can give workshops um, and talk to people about what to do, how to reduce food waste, how to make the most of the food they do have and for them to try different things and learn where food comes from. Um, so yeah, that's, yeah, that's me. And that's our little idea that we're hoping to pilot soon. Brilliant, thank you so much, Keenan. Um, we had a couple of questions in there about what about toilets? What about all the other bits of the bathroom? Sinks, do you think we should be looking at those two, possibly? Well, why not? Why not? You can do it all, just bathroom gardens. <laughs> Um, okay, uh, thank you very much, Keenan. And um, I'm now going to pass on to Helen from Kindling Trust, um, who has been running really um, amazing schemes um, quite close to us for years. So I'm sure you'll really enjoy her presentation too. Okay, can you see? Uh, can you see my share screen? We can. If you, I think, if you just make the and run the presentation. Ah. We'll be able to see. Hold on. Oh, sorry, everyone. Uh, it's in the way. Here we go. Slideshow. Is that doing it? Right. Great. Okay, brilliant. Um, so I just, that was really interesting listening to uh, the other two, and it and it's really interesting um listening to Freya particularly because we're so we're for Kindling Farm we're looking for a hundred plus acres uh to do a 
uh, agroforestry agri farm and Centre for Social Change and uh, kind of training scheme and everything. But it, it's really interesting listening and just the points of looking for land and what you do and building your business being exactly the same, whether it's a uh, or almost exactly the same if it's a three acre bit of land you're looking for or 100 acres uh so that was quite interesting i'm not I, i'm conscious of not uh repeating a lot of those things but i suppose i just wanted to um talk a little bit a little bit about what we are doing and um yeah how, kind of how we're how we're building that business and how we're building this initiative um so as i say we're looking for 100 acres plus uh the idea and the vision is about um creating a sustainable food system so the same as uh, like Keenan was talking about so in terms of um, creating access to land getting people more engaged in food um, and uh, kind of making sure that it's it's for everyone and uh, not just people that can afford to eat out organic restaurants um, but also at the same time making sure that we can create viable livelihoods for uh, sustainable food producers because it's actually and as I'm sure a lot of you know who are already looking into this and hoping to go into this is really quite hard to <laughs> make a living out of um out of producing food um so we've got kind of a a sort of large scale vision um and as Frey, Frey was saying we've sort of spent a lot of time talking to other farmers and talking to lots of different people uh I am trying to move my slides on they're not going anyway I'll just carry on you can look at this beautiful graphic instead um so yeah so we've got quite a lot of the projects that we've been doing um in greater manchester so far include uh setting up a training scheme for new growers uh which we um hoped like we will be carrying that on on the farm but on a different scale so rather than uh just teaching people to farm on a market garden scale we'll also be able to teach people kind of agroforestry and stuff around that um and then um we've been doing food access kind of looking at how to increase access to people and through doing we've got a veg bot scheme and we've got a uh, managed veg people which is a co-op of growers and buyers and workers um, and that's kind of the buyers of the restaurants but also um like the university of manchester is on board and stuff so so we've kind of built quite a big uh, market and kind of uh, credibility and experience as well um, and i suppose in a way that's kind of what I suppose I think is really important is saying is is starting with your market so for us we didn't start with a farm and say okay here's the here's the farm that we that we want to do something with we kind of looked at well what is the market what is the demand um and how do we then grow to meet that demand um and move anything on sorry um so we're looking at we've got a now that we've got that we've got a uh, we did start looking for land um it was actually really hard we're based up in uh manchester and a lot of the farms that we first looked at are pretty hilly and quite hard for growing veg because it's going to be red veg and cereals and trees at the farm that we're looking for um uh so we kind of we've sort of been approached by farm we also started off with the position of having no we didn't have the money to buy a farm as Freya said it's not the sort of thing that you've kind of got the cash sitting around when you're looking for three acres never mind 100 so um so yeah we kind of started off by um deciding that we wanted to do a community-owned farm um and actually as well as kind of the investment in the farm and getting and 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 people investing in the farm rather than donating money the thing that felt really important was to that people are then part of it that they're the members of the farm and that just feels really like a really important thing and also really like to change the food system we're sort of talking about completely changing the food system not just um trying to do that trying to do our own our own thing ourselves we want to make it a much wider thing and help other people to do it um so yeah we did a we've done a community shares um scheme we're in the middle of it at the moment um and we'll be relaunching it for our last month in the next couple of days um and we basically we're a community benefit society uh which means that everyone that invests can become a member of that we'll also hold the land in trust so that it'll always be used for um for, for growing food for growing food sustainably 
um, and will be controlled by its members and engaging its members. Um, you can set a minimum share rate, like a minimum amount that people can invest. So we've said £200, but we don't want that to stop people getting engaged with it. Um, so you can kind of get in, get together in a group and invest uh, or invest as family or buy it as presents for people and whatever. Um, we set our minimum raise as 390,000 and our maximum is 650,000 um, altogether. And within the first month we raised over 650,000. So, um, and it's just, people are just really excited. People wanna get involved. Um, and so I think it's a really, really interesting model and a really useful uh, model. And hopefully we'll be able to kind of help people learn from that model um, to do what, whatever scale farming, really. I think it's just really interesting. There's loads of other community share owned farms that have done it really successfully um, around the country as well. Not loads of other, but there are others. And there's uh, interesting the Ecological Land Co-op um, as well do a uh, interesting model that kind of help people to move on to land um i'm gonna stop rambling on i feel like i got a bit put off i'm afraid by by my slides not working but i can ha very happily answer questions thank you so much that was so interesting helen um we just had a question in the chat from mark and wendy asking how many investors made up that 690k uh it was over 300 i think there's about 350 altogether but we are reopening it um and it's interesting because it's quite a mix uh we also got some uh match investment um so they people do that as a kind of it's called the booster um investment fund thing and people you can they put in 100 uh, up to 100 but basically match every pound that someone else puts in and it's a way of building the momentum but they're in there as the same as any other a uh, community share investor, community shareholder. And how do, how do the returns work? Do, what do the investors receive as the return for their investment? So they can choose between uh, from up to 3%. Um, some people choose not to get any and do it as a kind of, as a, as a social investment, basically an ecological investment. And other people do choose to do it as a, um, a way of of kind of building their own, making making a bit of money. Um, for our model, you don't get that investment until two and a half years after we start trading. Um, and we ask people to leave their money in. So they cut for three years. So they can't withdraw for the first three years. And the idea of that is because it is quite hard to start up a food growing business, um, they can, it basically gives a bit of security where you're doing that first bit of kind of, you know, building up the land and, and starting to grow. And and trans changing the land from being uh, not organic and sometimes, you know, not very well cared for to being like organic and then the, you know, it takes five years for trees to become fully productive and all that sort of thing. So it just gives you that bit of extra time. But in that time, people can come and visit and get involved and be part of it and a part of making that decision. So when it comes to the point where people can withdraw their shares or get interest, all of those people as members will look at what the look at the accounting and say, well, can we afford to do this? Or yes, we can totally afford to do this. Or who gets to withdraw their shares? Or all that sort of thing. Fantastic! It's so interesting. It's really exciting about that. That's happening. Um, oh, I mean, you have to come and visit. Yeah, Keen and I are both based in Liverpool. It'd be fantastic to have something similar um, in our area. Um, so now I'm going to pass on to our um, final panelist, Kate. Um, who is from Shared Assets. Um, there we go. Katie, I'll pass over to you. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Um, can you all hear me? Yeah, okay. I just had a thing saying, would you like to unmute yourself? Um, really nice to be here. Um, and really, yeah, amazing to kind of follow such, um, such brilliant speakers and I think a lot of what I'm going to say is going to reinforce that uh, is going to reinforce what everyone said I do have some slides um oh can you see those or is that a dressing gown that I was looking at before I came on uh, wait 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 what's going on let me just close that I thought I was being really clever and getting them ready beforehand stop share we go back in here, escape that, go back in here. It's all very smooth. 
Okay. Share. Okay, you can see that, right? That's what you're supposed to see. Not my, not my dodgy internet shopping habits. Um, yeah, present. Um, so there's more on these slides than I'm going to talk about because I thought we could circulate them around, and I figured that other people would say some of some of the same things. Um, and I'm really looking forward to the discussion and the questions. So I will kind of whip through these, but we can obviously come back to anything. Uh, yeah, uh, I help run Shared Assets. We are a social enterprise. We're a think and do tank. Um, we work across the UK, but mostly in England. And our mission, I guess, is to reimagine what we can do with lands together. So we work with people, um, lots of people who are doing fascinating and really important food projects, but also people working in woodland management, increasingly thinking, people thinking about parks and public open spaces. And yeah, we're all about the people side of things. So we're not going to tell you what to grow when, but we we get very interested and geeky in the business models and the governance models and the kind of practicalities of working in a group of people to do something difficult, which is what almost every land project is in some way. Um, so what I've just got here is just a few, I think, considerations and pointers and questions to ask, but there's more we can go into around all of this stuff. Um, go so yeah as uh, both Freya and Helen mentioned being really clear about why you're doing what you're doing is really important having real clarity on purpose um and working out yeah is this just you something you want to do for fun or is this a group of you wanting to do something for fun and for community kind of bringing your community together or are you looking to make profit are you looking to make a, a, a genuine food growing business that's going to support your your livelihood and other people's livelihoods that's going to, you know, those the answers to those questions are going to have a big bearing on almost everything else. Um, this little circle thing is um, we completely stolen it from this guy called Simon Sinek, who is a business consultant. Um, is the called the Golden Circle or start with why, but it's quite a useful thing. If you you can get, um, it's really easy to say I'd like to create a food growing project or a farm, but actually getting down to why do you want to do it is going to be the thing that really helps you work out the right path to take and really whether also whether this is the right kind of path for you. Um, again, this has been mentioned, but yeah, getting then getting really clear on what you need and what which of those needs are kind of non-negotiable. And so, you know, for lots of people, if say you're you're creating a a project that's going to rely on lots of people volunteering, being close enough to a big enough population centre that you're likely to find volunteers is going to be really important. Or if you want to run a veg box scheme, being close enough to a, 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 enough of a market is going to be really important. But if you if you want what you're wanting to do is to create a project that supports you and your family, then maybe actually being far more rural will work for you. So all of these things are important. Um, but some of them will be more important than others, depending on where you are. Uh, just to pull up tenure, and like I say, I will circulate this so you don't, don't feel like you need to write it down, but um, this is something I, I pulled together a few years ago of just really trying to work out like what type of tenure do you need to match up with the, the why, like the purpose of what you're trying to do. And I think often it can be quite complex, um, but it's really worth thinking about, yeah, what is the, the kind of time scale and the, the level of formality that you need to kind of bring your purpose to life. Um, a bunch of this has been discussed, obviously look on estate agents, but yeah, lots of places, lots of, lots of land is never advertised. And if you're thinking about, um, unless you happen to have a kind of um, a little inheritance or something that you'd like to put into some land, right move probably isn't going to be your friend. Um, word of mouth, local networks, advertising, um, local authorities do have quite a lot of land and can be actually a very good source of, um, certainly in London, there's a number of pe people that are doing really good growing projects on ex-local authority, like plant nurseries and where they've got greenhouses and growing space like that, which is incredibly valuable. So looking at what your local council might have can be really interesting. I put this link into this new site and no affiliation with it. I don't know anything about it, but um, 
this a lot to me is a supposedly going to be Airbnb for growing spaces and then um, people can say I've got a bit of land that I would like someone to grow on and then somebody say I'd like to do some growing that might be one way um, we're also working we have a, a mapping tool at the moment called Land Explorer which is currently I think down so don't look at it right now but it's going to become this new thing called um, Digital Commons so just watch out for that there should there might be some interesting tools coming out of that bunch of other stuff to consider a lot of this has been mentioned um don't forget that you probably will incur legal costs if you are um lucky enough to kind of find a piece of land through word of mouth thinking about the type of agreement you need with the landowner and what liabilities you're both willing to incur who's going to be responsible for things like insurance and what protection you have against that person changing their mind oh just things to be aware of uh, whether you need to incorporate kind of set up a company or a community benefit society or a community interest company or something so that you've got a legal person who isn't yourself or your groups or your kind of group of people both to protect you if you enter into contracts and things go wrong and to potentially help you in raising money um, and yeah the thorny thing of planning permission which I'm not going to go into now but can be very sticky if you need land to if you need if you need to live on the land or if you are wanting to for example take over a woodland and use it primarily for forestry or agroforestry but also do educational work on it and need some equipment to support the educational work the planning system can be unfriendly we do have a bunch of resources on our website that can help with this but just a flag that is often a technical and sticky issue and yeah here's a bunch of links I won't run through them but there's there are there is some really good advice out there there's lots of people who've had similar headaches in the past and um yeah talk to people I think is the kind of key thing here but it's much much easier to have productive conversations with people if you're really clear about why you're trying to do this in the first place and what it is you think you need. And once you've done that thinking, go out and have a bunch of conversations. That is all I have to say. Thank you so much, Kate. Um, just, I mean, just looking at the poll, it seems like a lot of people here who are watching already grow, are looking to scale up, um, or maybe just enthusiastic and want to get into growing. And I think that all of the information that you've just shared would be really valuable. Um, so definitely, I mean, if everyone wouldn't mind putting their links into the chat, I'm sure that lots of people would really appreciate um, a lot of the knowledge that you've kind of um, circulated there. So I was going to ask the panellists um, to give me a few kind of pointers about what they're looking at when they're looking for land. But I think that a lot of you have discussed um, the things that are kind of your priorities. So we've discussed kind of having assured tenancies, making sure you've got water supply, making sure um, that your planning permission will be in place. Um, and with the community share scheme, that it's in the right kind of environment, that you're in, you're in a terrain that's going to work for you. But is there anything that you haven't mentioned that you think is really important when people are looking for land um, that, we, that the other panelists haven't discussed? Is there anything that any of you would suggest? Um, I've got a little thing, um, I think, that maybe hasn't been discussed. In the, something I heard about in sort of terms of uh, working in permaculture principles, in that don't go for something straight away. Stacey, they're my dog. Um, and ideally sit as long as you possibly can with the piece of land like you might have you might have completely said right this is it but then actually when you see it through the seasons it might completely change so don't hurry things a lot don't I've seen someone a friend of mine who tried to set up a food growing business and he, he got the land and he just went for it straight away and actually the access wasn't good enough the road he had a load of lorries coming in the, the road started falling apart he started having real big problems with them um, in the winter they were just like rivers running he didn't real. he just didn't realize that it was going to be so wet so um yeah things can look very different from season to season so it'd be good to sort of yeah make sure it's right speak to other people around the actual area no 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 i don't think they do and i suppose we've spoken quite a lot about um like really prioritizing your business plan and taking that time to get to grips with your land is really important 
And I think that sometimes when you're developing your business plan, you might not take that time into consideration. Um, <laughs> so have, putting a, a, a financial buffer in place to make to take it back that time into consideration, I suppose, is quite important. Um, also, a lot of you have spoken about um, the importance of networking and getting to grips with your local institutions. So, Helen, you spoke about um, kind of working with schools or universities, sorry. Um, how do you go about starting those conversations if it's something that you've never really done before? Um, just trying to think. I mean, I think I think it really is a sort of networking thing. And I think as well, because for us, we've kind of worked on developing uh, various projects over the last decade so we could kind of approach people by saying you know this is what this is what we've already done these are our, the things that we've put in place and the but I guess we I guess we sort of well we start I don't know I'm just thinking about with with the university because I think with um, restaurants and stuff we approached ones that said that they wanted to get locally produced food or or said they already got locally sourced food we kind of were like do you so we kind of went to visit them and uh, and said uh, where would you get your locally sourced food and they said the wholesale market so we were like explaining that that doesn't mean that it's locally produced and went and visited co-ops and all that sort of thing and I think we actually just got you know the societies might know people so you just it, you kind of find someone who's who's kind of I think we might have lost Helen there. Does really it, into that. I mean, a lot of universities are doing. Am I still sorry, there? You, you cut out for a second. Sorry, you were just saying. You know that that um, people are already doing things, and we, we or they want to be. Yeah, they want to be. And so it, I think if you can project, if you can take something kind of a really credible vision. So again, it's that thing of having done your your business plan and having kind of being able to show that you know your stuff. Talk to people. Like I think I totally agree with Freya. The thing of, as well about um like we came up with a matrix in terms of what are we looking for for land of uh, and do it when you're not in the land because honestly I would get excited and fall in love with any land at all that I'm so I sure saw so it's kind of if you take something there that is that has all of those things on it and just go along and then walk away from it and go do all these things does it meet these things or how many does it meet so I think it is about really showing that you've really thought it through and and really thinking things through and then people will trust you I think it is a bit harder with schools because they have to go through a kind of uh, they're going through another supplier or we would have to go through another supplier unless they can buy from lots of little producers anyway I'll stop rambling on but yeah I'm happy to answer um, well, we've had actually a few questions through about um, the Locality Act and um, if it's worth registering a, um, a community asset I don't know if anybody would be happy to answer that Kate I'm 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 happy to answer that because uh uh so the localism act was passed like in the it, the same time that like austerity was coming in and it was very much of the big society uh maybe the community can step up and run things kind of um and it has a, a series of rights within it, community rights, which aren't really rights to do anything. They don't enable you to really do stuff. But the one that's most relevant to land and buildings is the, the right to, it's called the right to bid. And essentially what happens is, yes, you as a community, a community forum, which has a definition in, so a re, sort of a representative community organisation that must consist of at least 21 people, um, can say that we think something, whether it's in public or private ownership, is an asset of community value. You have to be able to prove that its current or recent past use makes it an asset of community value. So the last pub in the village, almost certainly, the last petrol station in the village, maybe, um, the one village hall or community centre in the village, again, almost certainly, but you get a theme here, right? It works where you've got very clearly defined communities. Um, that piece of land that really could have been better used and that we would like to do a great food growing project on, almost certainly not. 
and all and and in London, say, there is a site called Keep It In The Community, which I think just is abbreviated to kiitc.org.uk, probably, which has a map of successful assets of community value and, and the ones that have been applied for and have been unsuccessful. So you can kind of look in your area and see what the, count, the council has to make a decision on it. But say, there's lots of pubs near me that people have tried. I live in Tottenham in North London that people have tried to register as assets of community value and the council said they aren't. All it does is give you, if, some, if the person decides to sell, if the owner decides to sell, the, um, the community organization gets notified and they can choose to put a moratorium of up to six months on the sale to give them the time to raise the money to buy it. It doesn't take it out of the market. It doesn't make it any cheaper. Um, it doesn't guarantee that the owner will actually sell to you. but it's something so if you if you have an eye on a specific piece of land that has value for the community in certain ways or if you say have a community garden that is currently existing but isn't protected by anything or an allotment site that isn't a statutory allotment site may well be worth doing it's not going to be the way that you get your dream growing site though so yeah that's what i have to say about that I know that um, in Scotland, has it, have you? Do you know if anyone's used the community compulsory purchase um, in Scotland effectively to get land? I know that somebody was trying, a group was trying. I don't know if it's come off. I mean, yeah, the the the, fra the legislative framework in Scotland is so much further ahead than where it is in England. There may well be people people from Scotland in the room who know in more detail, but certainly the community right to buy has been. Um, has been very well used in Scotland. Um, although thinking about it from a kind of system point of view, what that does is essentially take lottery money, take public money out of the sort of charitable sector and give it to landowners and then they get richer. <laughs> and uh, the community then has raised three million pounds or whatever to buy this piece of land. And they're then starting at point zero, which as Helen pointed out is probably 10 years from where you're ever going to be starting to make any money so it's a uh, if you were designing a system you probably wouldn't start with that but there's definitely many more tools in Scotland in terms of the specific compulsory purchase stuff I don't know but there's they've done a lot more around vacant and derelict land and yeah trying to really push that up the agenda so um, I'm sure people will be using that right even if they haven't used it yet but it's yeah we're a long way off getting something like that in England. Mm -hmm. And when we're talking about kind of urban growing, I know Keen and we, the work that we're doing, we've um, worked with the church. How easy or difficult has it been to Church of England? How easy or difficult has it been to talk to um, kind of urban landowners about using their space to um, grow food? Well, as you know, I mean, we're really at, at the beginning of that process. So I suppose we're going to end up potentially running into issues but what we have I think is um, a willingness on certainly on the church's part I mean we're, we work with the dean of Nosley quite closely and he seems very keen so hopefully that it that will be quite snag free um, in terms of other urban spaces and working with um, procurement organizations and developers it really yet to be seen as well um they might completely go for it and really buy in but it might take um a bit of persuading because obviously any space that they give to this would take out of space that they could potentially build and sell on so it would really have to um pull on their heartstrings and appeal to them from like a social value um point of view but i mean they, they they're willing to engage at the minute so it might be that they um that they sort of are quite happy to do that. And yeah, I've just seen Lucy has popped up on the chat. Is it possible to make baths look pretty too? Yeah, the idea is that they're cladded with um, nice wood. So it's not just quite white acrylic baths lumped everywhere across uh, community spaces. And um, the idea is that, you know, you do them up nicely and um, yeah. But. Um, Freya, there was something that we spoke about in our last session that was totally fascinating um where you said that you used facebook to find land um it was just one of many methods yeah 
methods. <laughs> and I just thought for, for if anybody's like struggling to start making those networks using social media is actually a viable option. You can do it from your sofa. <laughs> <laughs> It was uh, someone I hadn't spoken to for a year or two, but she had seen my, uh, I just put a post out saying, I'm going to be starting Old Tree Market Garden. Um, I need some land. It's very like, as um, I think Kate said, very clear, like, this is what I need. And I even listed in there, like, a, a, just a quick summary of what I was looking for, but very concise. And uh, this friend saw it and then told, she works at the Max Farm where the, the landowners where I now have the piece of land. Um, and she just mentioned it to her boss. She said, oh, a, a good friend of mine who is a farmer, she's looking for some land. We've got quite a bit. Like, do you think you'd be up for that? And they thought, oh, that's a great idea. Yeah, why not? Um, so it was really, really positive. Definitely <laughs> worth putting it in all the spaces you possibly can. Mm. And um, Helen, I just saw that you put the, the your food hub was on an old council um, nursery site. And I know that the Lancaster Farm Start um, group have also used um, uh, uh, ex council um, nursery site. How easy or difficult was it to start talking to the council or to access council owned land? Um, we had, I mean, we they sort of invited us on really because we'd been doing other work around and they'd seen what we've been doing. But but we do also know other groups that have just gone and approached the council and said, here's a bit of the park. So for us, it was like it had an old, uh, massive old glass house in it that was getting a bit dangerous. So they took that down um, and just had put, put infrastructure in there and just wanted people to be using it. Um, but yeah, the, you can approach them. We also did a similar thing with uh, our first farm start site where we just went wrote round to loads of the local growers and just said, has anyone got any land they're not using that we could um, have a little corner of to train new growers? And actually they really wanted to because they really, people really want to help other growers get into growing. I, that's what we found anyway, I don't know. But yeah, and I think, I've, yeah, I think it's really possible in, in urban areas to to find to find bits of land but i think it is quite useful to kind of be able to show that you that you're gonna do stuff that you're kind of serious about it somehow okay to you um, yeah just to add on the urban thing um something that you get quite that you see certainly in places like london is meanwhile growing sites so when a developer is like we've got this land, we're not going to use it for the next 10 years or five years or three years. And certainly some groups, like places like the Story Garden, which it was in King's Cross and has kind of moved around, have been able to design really interesting and really impactful growing projects based on the fact that everything is going to have to move. And, you know, down to putting planters on wheels so you can just like move along to the next place. And that could be particularly good if you're looking to kind of build up a track record and that you know that you want to do something for say a couple of years try it out and then potentially look to move somewhere where you can actually be in the soil longer term but that you can then be going to people saying i've actually done this quite successfully where it can be really problematic is that thing where people want to save a particular piece of land and then they're going to get chopped off it anyway and if you and it, it can be a very um pragmatic way of going okay let's get hold of this and then we're going to refuse to leave when the time comes if that's what um if that's what you want but it can be I think if you go into it with your eyes open the kind of meanwhile thing with developers you're obviously you're slightly greenwashing for them and so you need to make sure you're getting a good enough deal to kind of make that worth your while but it could be it can be one option um you probably when you leave when you move you might end up losing a lot of the local networks and community that you've built up so it's sort of it's definitely something to be a little wary of but it can be it can work I think. Helen was did you have a follow-on point to that? Yeah I suppose I suppose we visit we did I think Kate's really right and I but I really really urge people to think about it because we I think what we found was as well you can kind of pour your heart into doing things and, and actually quite a lot of resources into improving soil and I guess if you're also if you're growing on urban sites you've got to be really careful about the soil unless you know what what's been there and what's been happening around it and it just 
yeah, it could just be quite hard to leave <laughs> once you've done that much work on it. And the other thing just to quickly add as well is we did get offered, shown a few other sites before we took the um, the site that we're on for this, for Woodbank Community Food Hub. And um, it's really worth asking what else happens there or what did happen there and or just because basically one of them was like a place where the kids play football and it's like oh my god a we wouldn't want to do that we wouldn't want to take it off them and b they would absolutely have trashed it if we had so it's just like you know you don't want to make any enemies of your neighbors before you even start so I just mention that and um, well we've only got a few minutes left so i'd urge anybody who's watching if you have any questions send them in um and i would just like to um round up really by asking the panelists to recommend any organizations that they think um, we should all know about. Um, so if you follow the same kind of pattern as the presentation, so Freya, is there anyone that you would like to recommend to anybody who's watching that can help with access to land or kind of um, developing your dreams of growing food? Uh, also, sorry, Helena, Lucy's just asked, uh, what's everyone's favorite food to grow? So maybe yeah. that's a nice thing for people to say as well. <laughs> Yeah, I was just having having a quick think. I, I think my main one would be just to put it everywhere, ask ask it as many groups as possible. But I find I really love the Land Workers Alliance. I find them amazing. They've got a great resources page on uh, uh, yeah advice on how to start up and funding and everything. So yeah, Land, Land Workers Alliance probably my my one. And my favorite food to grow, really hard. Uh, I love them all. The diversity is what makes it fun. But I've been because it's summer and I haven't started yet, I love pinching out tomatoes. Um, so I love growing tomatoes. I don't actually eat tomatoes, but I just I just love the plants and they smell amazing. Uh, yeah, I'm gonna go with tomatoes. <laughs> okay, and Keenan? So I, I just think interesting people to look out for and some that we've done a little bit of work with, um, are Manchester Urban Diggers, they're doing some really cool things over in Manchester and at Platfields Market Garden. And they also do some work with a restaurant. I think it's based in Stockport called the restaurant where the light gets in. Um, and they've turned, I think it's the top of their building, which used to be a car park into a rooftop garden called the landing i think and i love just watching what they're doing because i think they're doing a really good job um, and growing food i love tomatoes as well and chili because i like doing the fermenting and pickling and hot saucing and stuff so yeah chilies we've got a few different types of chili in the greenhouse at the minute at home so yeah cool thank you keenan and helen well, I would have said shared assets if Kate wasn't on already. Uh, also Land Workers Alliance, also Ecological Land Co-op. I would also say if you're in Scotland, Nourish Scotland are pretty bloody amazing, have huge brains. So definitely look up them. Uh, I would, for my favourite things, too many things, I think I'd, oh, strawberries, kale, squash. And Kate, if you wouldn't mind writing up. up. Um, so yeah, I think organizations to check out all everything, everything that everybody else has said. And thanks for the shout out, Helen. Um, the, um, I would really urge you, there's two, there's the LION, which stands for Land in Our Names, which is um, all about mobilizing a network of black and people of color, food growers and farmers and, and sort of, helping uh, communities of color get better access to lands. They're doing really amazing work and um, everybody should check them out. On a similar note, um, there's a Black Land and Spatial Justice project, which is uh, maybe got a slightly more of an urban focus, but not entirely. But yeah, looking at thinking about how do we need to redistribute resources to really achieve social and racial justice in the land system. Um, and yeah, Land Workers Alliance, Sustain can be pretty good, um, Ecological Land Co-op, Kindling Trust. Um, there's there's lots of people out there doing really interesting and good work. Unfortunately, none of them probably have a key that they can give you access to land without you doing a whole heap of work. Um, I'm a, I have a 
uh, me and my partner share an allotment with our neighbors and so we're, we're very much hobby growers and I would up until yesterday I would have said my favorite food to grow was broad beans because I had this like really smug little patch of broad beans like sitting there all flowery and I went to the allotment yesterday and they're absolutely covered in aphids and so I don't I don't know herbs chai I've got a good amount of chives going on at the moment so I'm going to say chives and nasturtiums that's about my level of skill <laughs> And I've got so we've had a small flurry of questions through. Um, so there's one question if somebody can answer very quickly about if anybody knows of any um, building projects on rural exception sites, uh, or maybe even in urban context, where large scale community commercial food growing or new orchards or agroforestry um, or woodlands are taken into the planning considerations at the beginning of the process. Does anyone know? Uh, I don't know anything that's a reality. I know a few people who would like to do something like that, but uh, nothing that I've seen in reality, but I, I'd love to know if there are, because that would be great. Um, I have a, a kind of idea on that I just thought of. Uh, a company called Human Nature in Lewis have just bought a massive industrial estate and they want to turn it into uh, housing with, um, the reason I know about it is my partner might, runs a compost club in Brighton, um, and they want to compost all of the food waste on site using small scale human labor and, and have it integrated in. And they also want to have a small food growing site. I don't think it's, it's not like a commercial size. It's not going to provide for everyone, but they're doing it in a really lovely way. And um, they've just bought it. So it hasn't actually happened either, but human nature is the name of the company. Brilliant. And very quickly, Helen, do you mind explaining what Farm Start is uh, and Farm Start program? So Farm Start is a, is, um, a training program uh, that is about trying to give people access to land and skills and uh, to start them off on their sort of food growing journey um, in a supported environment. So it's basically a way there's a few different models, but you can either on our model, you're uh, growing alongside a, a experienced grower and you get a few a few years of that experience and some classroom based training and use of tools and uh, and then you get to take on a bit of land on that same site and then the idea is that we support you to move off onto another site or onto our farm where we will have an enormous agroforestry project and it will be a, very exciting on other ones you get a um a like quarter of an acre or half an acre and you set up your own business and it's about again in a supported environment trying to develop your own business um and there's some really great models there's uh, one in london uh, Wales so organically Lancaster has been mentioned already one down in Tamar grow local so yeah various amazing ones brilliant thank you so much and thank you to all of our panelists I feel like this has been a really interesting conversation and um, that I'm sure we could carry on for a long time um, the recording of this session will be available on YouTube and on the feedback website I think and um, if anyone does have any questions, you can send in an email or you can message us on social media or any of the social medias. Um, and I'd just like to say thank you very much for everyone to everyone for attending. Um, if anyone has um, any questions, just get in touch and we hope to see you at the next event. Thank you very much.